Hey guys. Hey guys. I'm sorry, you guys. I had to go get the book. I, I didn't have the book. Hey guys. I'm back. I'm back. Hi, 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 everyone. Are you there? Are you there? Are you there? How are we? I'm excited to be here today. I've tried, I wanted to do all the book clubs in the month that the book clubs were a thing, but but yeah, <laughs> um, I was reading a comment, but yeah. We're here today on April 2nd because I couldn't get to this book when I wanted to get to this book. But yeah, hi you guys. How are you guys? We are back for another Lily Reads book club. I made a promise to myself to start taking these stickers off the minute I read the book so they just don't dwell on my books. Because I've been buying a lot of books from Target recently. But uh, yeah, we're here to discuss Kennedy Ryan's before I let go, blur by the one and only Colleen Hoover. I wait for people to trick in, trickle in and I can tell my Colleen Hoover story. I went to the bookstore yesterday. How the fuck is every single one of Colleen Hoover's books in publication? And not only, of course, they're in publication, but like available to buy at Barnes and Noble. It is kind of Colleen Hoover's world and we are all living in it. Like, let's give, like, we have to give tens where tens are due. And you, every single time I go into a bookstore and see the Colleen Hoover section, you are going to see a slew of little white girls just entranced, just entranced with the guy. And you want to know what? It doesn't even, I don't even mind. It's the verity of it all. I am going to be so honest with you. Can you guys hear me? If you guys can't hear me, say it down below because I'm using the mic and sometimes it mutes itself. And then I'd be stuck. But yeah, it's the Verity of it all. People like to say that Verity is a good book. And that one, that one, that kills me. It's very, I hate Verity. <laughs> I hate Verity because I fucking love domestic thrillers. I'm one of the few people who are like on the internet who can appreciate the greatness of domestic thrillers. And so when people talk about Verity, it really bugs my soul because there's absolutely nothing good about that book. Like, it's not even a good domestic thriller. Like, it's it's bad. Like, it's Tyler Perry written bad. And so when people sit in my face and it's like, but Verity is good. I'm just like, you literally could pick up any domestic thriller and I promise you, you'll be gagged like more. Like, oh my gosh. So like, it's the Verity of it all when it comes to Colleen Hoover with me because everything else, Everyone has their trash romance that they enjoy. I don't feel like judging at the moment. But Verity is just a bad domestic thriller. <laughs> it is a bad domestic thriller and it hurts my soul. But that's not what we're here for. It was just crazy that I saw all those Colleen Hoover books at Barnes & Noble. I was just like, oh my God. But anyways, back to the point. We're here. The reason why I brought up Colleen Hoover, because she's the blurber. She's the blurb, which makes sense when you read the book. Colleen Hoover loves a nice dramatic romance. And so this would this is up Colleen Hoover's alley. Colleen Hoover can't write this well, as in like the prose of this book. Colleen Hoover can't do that. But this is up Colleen Hoover's alley. And you know what? I'm pretty sure it's a big deal to have Colleen Hoover blurb your book. Like Colleen Hoover is, like I said, it's Colleen Hoover's world. We're living in it. So like that's a big deal. So good for Kennedy Ryan getting the Colleen Hoover cosign. But what are you guys' thoughts on the book? I'm still getting this sticker off, by the way. Like one, one centimeter at a time. What's your thoughts on the book? What are you guys giving the book? What are you... For me, I'm willing to be swayed. I know what I want to give the book, but I'm willing to give, I'm willing to be swayed on what I give this book. What are y'all giving this book? Let me hear it. Let me hear it. And so many people have read this book way before my book club, obviously. Lily Reed's book club ain't, you know, <laughs> ain't turning the dial. But like, um, so I feel like a lot of you have read this book because I saw a lot of you log this book like throughout the months since it has come out. So what are you guys giving this book? Let's see. We have four stars. We have 3.5, four stars. We have three. We have 3.5. We have, we have five. 
We have four, 3.5. We're getting a lot of 3.5 fours. Okay, the fives are rolling in. The fives are rolling in. And then we always got a critic. <laughs> we always got Shanice. Shanice is like two, like, and wasn't feeling it. Um, 4.5. When I first read it, 3.5, four, an enthusiastic four. With all my complaints, it's a five out of five. I read it in one sitting. Um, I didn't read it in one sitting, but I did read this book in 24 hours. And most of the time I do read my all the book club books in um and in a couple days. Like I always read it the weekend before due. But this book I literally read in exactly 24 hours. I started it Friday night at around seven o'clock and I finished it. It's around seven o'clock the same day. And I did something. I read this book fairly quickly. It literally took me a couple hours to read this book. And believe it or not, I am not a fast reader. I feel like because I read a lot of books, people think I read fast. But that is not, I don't think the key to being a reader, like someone who reads a lot of books, is re being a fast reader. It's called being goal oriented. If you, you guys can't see this, but I have dog ears on all of my pages and that is how I choose to read books. I set goals for myself while reading a book. So if I'm like, I need to read, finish this book in the next three days, I chunk out the book. So like, I'll be like, you got to read 60 pages by this time and you can't do anything until you do that thing. And so that's how I get 60 pages. Then, then I'm like, we need to read a hundred pages. And so I do that one second. And so that is how I do do it. I section it out. And so this book, I really didn't have a hard time meeting any of the goals uh, for this because this book was very easy to read. I can never be a test for the um, audio book because for the book club stuff, I don't read the audio book. So by the way, and that's going to be an issue because I do not know how to pronounce these people's names. Like I know how to pronounce Josiah and Yasmin, but yeah, this book was really easy to read. I was like setting little like, okay, got to read this like chunk there, chunk there. And it was really easy to read. This is just well written, very easy to go. But back to y'all ratings. I'm sorry. Not cried. I cried a lot. Y'all will get on that because I do have actually have stuff to say on the matter. Okay, for me, for me, I'm giving this book a four with complaints. A four, but not a lot of, like, here's the thing. I'm actually, this is why I'm undecided. I The first 100 pages of this book, the reason why I read this book so fast, the first 100 pages, I was fully in it. Like I was full, I'm like, ooh, this shit good as hell. This shit good as hell. And then and I went through a lull. Then I got back to it. Like this book was setting up from the beginning and enjoyment and enjoyment. I give this book a 4.5, like fully enjo being enjoying it, being engrossed in the book. I give the book a 4.5, but- but, but I also had things like I didn't really like narratively about it. So like, where do I go with that? Where do I go with those complaints? That's the weird part about like reviewing books. Sometimes I can really enjoy a book, but I have complaints. So where do I put those complaints? I don't know. I don't know because this is a romance book and that's like my main complaint of this book. But yeah, how do you guys feel? It started so messy and so interesting. Like I was so in it. And here is the thing. I am someone who's like maybe even on record saying I don't really like dramatic romances. Like kind of spare me with that. Like I'm here for fun and good times. And so when I was in it, I was like, whoa, maybe I don't know myself. So I was in it immediately. But I do feel like towards the like middle, maybe late middle, it got a little melodramatic. Like it got a little melodramatic for me. And so I wasn't as in it as I was in the first 100 pages. And then the then I, I came back and then, and then, and then. So let me get into my notes. Cause we ain't gotta be here all day. Um, so in my notes, I put, okay, first of all, the best quote in this book, best quote, I don't need a wish because I have hope, great quote. I don't need a wish because I have hope. 
great goddamn quote. Like Kennedy Ryan, the prose in this book, the, the way she is writing in this book, just excellent. And it is proof that books do not have to be written terribly just because they are a romance book. Either you can write or you can't. And Kennedy Ryan is somebody who can write. She's someone you can tell respects the art of writing. She is someone who respects the English language. And like the writing in here, just so good. But yes, favorite quote for me, I don't need a wish because I have hope. Um, so my big like, hmm, hmm, of the book. You know how I said um this is a romance book. Let me ask y'all. Let me tell y'all my opinion, and then y'all below y'all might me for this. I'm ready. I don't know if they should be together in the end. I, I'm, I'm. That's just my opinion. I don't know in the end if these two people should be together. And so, like, it's a romance book. And, like, the obvious at the ending of a romance book, you should feel like, wow, love is real. I don't know if I believe these two people should be together at the end. Like, I just don't know if this book has convinced me in 379 pages that this these two people need to spend the rest of their life together. Like, I don't, and that's the thing. I'm also, when it comes to romance, I'm not a... I'm used, I'm a good, they're good for now. I'm okay with my characters being good for now. You guys can break up two weeks after the book finishes, but like, I'm okay with like, we read a good story all together right now and whatever happens tomorrow is none of my business. So I don't need my characters seem like they are like so in love and just gonna be together forever and have millions of kids and all that. I don't think, the, like the idea of this book is like, wow, before I let go, before I let this this man out of my life, maybe we should like, you know, see what we have. I just don't know if this book convinced me that these two people need to give it another go, that this family just needs to be together. And these two people just really need. I let the book give me like the last 100 pages to prove to me like, OK, these two people need to be with each other and... Did it? Did it? Y'all tell me. Y'all tell me. That's the convincing I need. Convince me that these two people, Yasmin and Josiah, his name is Josiah, child. It's Vashita. Yasmin, it's Vashita, whatever. Tell me that these two people need to be together. Yeah, that lost me too. Him asking her to marry him in the end. I was just like, mm, mm, mm. What really got me well, really, we will get on that, too. If I can get through my notes. I always say we'll get on something, then we'll be getting on something because I get sidetracked. But I'm going to stay focused today. We will get on that as well because I have thoughts on smuts. <laughs> my issue is I was all for them being together again until she started talking about having another baby again. That's when she lost me. Because I'm just like, hmm, you saying you healed but like, it's not giving healed. It's giving, it's giving like you kind of just, you, <laughs> you want your life back that it was before you lost your child, but that's never going to come. And maybe you're just want him back because he represents what your life was when it was good. And you believe like your final part of healing it's being with him. Like I've healed and I'm ready to get my man back. But sometimes healing is moving on. Sometimes healing is moving on to another child. Like I will never be the person I was before I lost my child. But her wanting another baby again, him not wanting another baby. And somehow when we get to the last chapter, they've decided they're gonna adopt kids or like foster kids or what they do an adoption. And it's just like, hmm, I don't know if we've healed. I don't know if we've healed or we just trying to are we just trying to, you know, we're just trying to get back to what was, but what was isn't there. I, you know, we've gone through this entire book and what's rest, like the ideas on healing and like, you know, just because we lost our child, it doesn't mean we lost each other and we didn't lose our family. But the book also makes it seem in the end, like you guys need all of those things and or like you guys still deeply desire those things. So what if you don't get those things? What if you're not able to go through with adoption? What if? one of your kids dies again. Um, what, like, what if, like anything can happen. And you, the point is that you should be stronger. You should be able to get through those things. Even if bad things happen, I'm stronger. I've come out on the other side. I've went through those things. And now I know how to handle those things. These two characters have not shown me Josiah more than Yasmin. Yasmin more than Josiah. 
has not shown me that if something were to happen to a, adoption to fall through anything to happen to one of her children or someone she know her mother or something she would be like she wouldn't spiral once again into a really dark place and so I'm just like hmm I just think her relationship in her marriage represents something to her a time in her life that was good and so she wants to get back to that time so the ending really took me for a spin And that's also what I was thinking. I was okay when they were um, talking about that couple who they met in Charlotte who never got married. I was okay with them just having like a situationship. Like we're together till we decide that we're not together. I think that would actually be a really cool ending to a romance story that like, if we want to be with each other, there's room for that. And if we decide that this is no longer serving us, there's a place for that conversation too. I think that would be a really, because that's what it gives. I do think that Josiah, Josiah should live with them. I really, really do. Um, and I think they would be a good, like, there's no reason for them not to live together. We see that from the be very beginning. Like, why the hell y'all not living together? Like, if y'all can get along, like, live together, who cares? But do they need to be remarried? Do they need to be adopting a child? No, especially because the two you get, because the two you get need some attention too. To comments. a lot was so was on their breakup was messy and the stuff that they were saying to each other that night that they decided to break up like I just don't think we've recovered from those things I just don't think we've healed fully from them but I'm willing to be swayed because like I gave the book four out of five stars but I just I don't know I kept read I read the last 100 pages and I'm just like do I believe this is a couple that needs to be together like I like them well enough but do they need to be together oh <sighs> I agree. And that's another thing. Like, have we have we seen what fish are in the sea? Have we seen what else is out there for both of them? It doesn't even have to be just the Yasmin thing. It could be for both of them. Like, all he did was date the cook. Like, have y'all seen that maybe, like, I, this is why I go back to, like, maybe it's just, like, trauma responses. You wanting to go back to what your life was before. So you're back with this person. This person is the only one who fully knows your trauma. So you feel like you need to be with them. But, like, what if there is something more in life? Like you've done this chapter. What if there is something more? What if there is better days out there, you know, with someone else? You could still have this great relationship with your ex-husband and your kids. But like I said, there could be an avenue for you guys to like date other people, you know? When if if y'all feel like that's if that if y'all feel like that's necessary and like that conversation never really happens because it's just like we exclusive we together now we married and it's just like maybe y'all should just live and raise some kids that's this this brings me to another one of my points yes Yasmin wants kids like she wants kids over anything and I don't think that's healing I do not think if you lose something and you and you are tunnel vision about getting that thing back, you have healed from the loss. Because healing from that loss means you have learned that you are still whole or you can still be whole without that thing. That thing is not something you deeply, deeply need in order to be whole, but her health is at risk if she carries a child again. And yet she's walking down to the drugstore like it's another day. And it's just like, girl, you could be in danger. <laughs> You can like why, but that's not even something you're thinking about. Your husband is thinking about that more than you. That's so there's no, there's no heal there. You have not healed from that situation. You still think having a third child is going to be the thing that will complete you, will be the thing that makes you whole. And you have not healed from those things. Who you have not. And I don't think the book has proved to me that that is a thing that she has healed from. She went through something deeply traumatic. And I think to prove to herself that she's over this traumatic thing, she thinks that she gets get something in return she has something to show for like I have another baby I'm good but like 
anything could happen to that another baby and anything could happen to the two kids you have now. The point and when you go through something traumatic and you lose something in a traumatic way is knowing that once if something traumatic were to happen to you again, you have the tools to get over that thing. You will be able to come out on the other side. You won't spiral to a deep depression like she was in. This nothing she still proves me that. It does not prove it. And that's okay. Because that's some what happened to her was absolutely devastating. It's okay to not be on the other side of that. But you can't just have a child and think, ooh, ooh, anything happened to that baby. Especially adoption. Adoptions fall through every single day. Like, I don't know if we we we've come over that. But anyways, I have other topics I want to talk about. Okay, so let's start with Deja being the real villain. Deja is the real villain of this story, and I do not condone hitting children, but baby, but do not hit your children. Do not hit your children. I'm calling CPS. I promise you, don't play with me. But Deja played with me one too many times. De Deja had to come see about me. Deja, she was me from start to finish. Y'all, when she told her daddy, why would you even want to get back with her? I threw the book. I threw the book across the room. I said, you've tried me one too many times. She was mean to her mother. She was mean to her mother. She was cruel to her mother. She was talking crazy about her mother. And I was, I was fed up. I was fed up. I was just like, no. <laughs> Deja wouldn't live with me no more. Deja had to go live with her goddamn daddy playing with me because I couldn't, I could, I never hated a child more than I hated Deja in this book. And then I was expecting the redeeming moment for Deja for like, Deja to have this moment where it's just like, I'm unsure of myself and like, you guys not being sure it makes me feel good. But no, she just hate her mama. <laughs> she just hate her. She just hates the fact that her mama was depressed. And I get it. Deja's a child. Deja's a child. But I feel like there is a way to write this that makes Deja somewhat like you understanding Deja. But Deja was just being so cruel to her mother. Like so. Like why would you even want to get back? And she left us for this. And did you see the way she act? And when mama went crazy, and I'm just like. Who talks about their mother like this? The mother who they live with, the mother who pays for them to go to private school, the mother who is doing everything for you. I would get it if there was something to show that Deja was like deeply neglected, but there's just, the book didn't show any of that. And so it just came across as like Deja was bad as hell. Like my first notes, like literally from the first time we meet Deja, I said Deja's bad as hell. Like De Deja had to come see about me. Like, made me so mad. Like, so I was just like, I sh a 13-year-old should not send me up the wall like this. A 13-year-old should not send me up the wall like this. Like, she, and then the thing is, it's the sass for me. <laughs> it's the talking back for me because you have your opinions. But it's the way she went about giving those opinions that was just like, you are speaking out of turn. You are speaking out of turn and it's rude. And it's rude. So she was too rude for me. No, the house had no discipline. The house had no discipline. Thank God the best character in the story, which is a son. I love that little boy. That little boy, the son is the is the redeeming quality of that household because that son, he is so adorable. When he was talking about skipping a grade and he was like, yeah, I'm okay with skipping a grade as long as I like still get to go over to Jamal's and play Madden. Like that like tugged on my heartstrings because he just wants to have his friends. And he's like, yeah, I take it slower because I don't want the kids to feel like I'm rushing. He was so cute. He was, he had some sense. So thank God, thank God one of the kids in the house has sense because huh, huh? Absolutely not. Your mother is letting you be all up on TikTok, trying to be an influencer, going all types of places to find you pack hair and all that. And you can't give her a crumb, a crumb. And then you heard your mama and your daddy arguing and you still think your mother is all to blame for like your problems. Mm-mm. 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 Face of Dylan, of Dylan. All right, so let's, and then next storyline, the therapy storyline. At first, with the therapy storyline, I was kind of over it. I'm like, I ah, played. But as the therapy storyline kept going with Josiah, that's his name. If I'm saying his name wrong, stay with me. I really started to enjoy it. I really, really started to enjoy it. I love the fact that, like, in the beginning, he was, like, really slow to want to 
um give information to, to his therapist and then like the more he kept going to therapy like he felt like he like had to give the information back that was a real representation of like once you share traumatic things that have happened to you you can't stop sharing like once you tell somebody all the stuff that has happened to you and you finally have someone who will listen or you finally feel like you have a sounding board like someone who will, like you have something to get this out you can't stop I just thought it was really real it was really real and I like the son going to therapy and being able to talk about that and I also love with the son this idea that like everyone around you is going to die when you start seeing people around you die and you start seeing people lose stuff you don't really know as a child I spent, I was talking about this on my Patreon on one of my podcasts. I was talking about how like, even me now, I spend so much time thinking about people dying. <laughs> I spend so much time thinking, I think it's the pandemic and how much death was in the pandemic. And I think so much about people dying and how people are going to die. So seeing the child talk about that and how like, you constantly are worrying about the people around you leaving because you see people living. And it's hard to really process all of that. Even as an adult, I'm an adult. It's hard to process all that. So talking about how going to therapy can help you process all of that. And like the overarching theme of this book, this idea that you will lose stuff, losing stuff is a part of life. I think someone said that in the book about how the longer you live, the more people you're going to lose. That's the, you know, double edged sword of getting older, the older you get, the older other people get and like people just leave people die. But that does not mean that life isn't worth living doesn't mean it's not worth having those things for the time that you have those things and the joy you had in those moments is the victory of those things just like the dog the dog that's gonna eventually die really young and all that I just really love this idea that even though it can be morbid and even though it can be sad all the death in this book it shows that death doesn't mean that you don't have so many other things I loved it I loved it I really love the purpose of this book now let's get into Vashti how do you pronounce our girl's name how do you pronounce our girl's name from one of the very first notes in my notes is about Josiah one of my very first notes is he's dead fucking wrong he's dead fucking wrong if Deja's the villain one Josiah's villain two but they can be villain one and two all the same they're the same villain me because he was literally my first note is Josiah's going to hell and I was talking about his relationship Oh, uh, with Vashti. Here's the thing. Vashti is one of those characters, like she's a non-character. Like they, we don't get any characterization about her except she, she can cook. So like, I don't dislike her, nor do I like her. Like she's, she's put in the book as just like a thing. Like she's a, she's a piece of cardboard as a character. Like you, you're intentionally kept at like arms length with her because they don't want you to actually build any sort of connection with her because she's not the purpose of the story so like I can't fault Kennedy Ryan for that that character there's always a character like this in the book who you're only going to see one side of them because that's the point you're not supposed to know them and so like liking her and not liking her is not really the point it's the way that they treat the character they treat the character like she's just not a factor I why why was he playing in this girl's face I hate it when like she was sending text messages and wanting to see him and he was thinking about it like when does it become when does it become mean when does it become mean this is one of my least favorite things in all of romance books a book what is that stupid faker that stupid book faker did this as well and they did it the worst when there's that like side character who is dating one of the characters or wants to date one of the characters see Mark Mark it, the Mark character in this book is utilized better in that because they give Mark certain characteristics that you just offhand will never like. He's a congressman, like lawyer, like he's white. Like they give you characteristics that you're already going to go against. So like it's easy to like dislike him. It's easy to be like, who gives a fuck about Mark? Because he's in a powerful position. He, You're just like, okay, Mark, you'll be fine. But Vashti, is not in that position. She's a cook at you guys' restaurant. And she's nothing but nice. She's nice to your children. And all she wants is to be in a relationship with like a guy that she's working with, which I won't discuss the power dynamics of that because we don't have to do that here. But she just wants to be in a relationship with her boss and you can't eat. How does it even get to the point where you didn't tell her like, Hmm, I'm not healed for my wife. Like, why would you not nip that in the bud before it even starts to come a thing? How is Yasmin nicer to her than you are? She 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 really got this shit in the stick. And then when they broke up, 
when they broke up and she started begging that man, I said, girl, please walk out with the, with the crumb of dignity you got left. When she started saying, well, but maybe we can't. Oh, my God. I said, Kennedy, you're not going to let my girl walk out here with a crumb of integrity, with a crumb of integrity, with a crumb of pride. Like she's really begging this man to be with her. The text messages of wanting to see him and him breaking up, her going to the Thanksgiving and <sighs> how does grandma have to be the one to tell you to be nice to your girlfriend? Like what you're doing is too much. I was hoping she would at least get the chance to break up with him. I was hoping at the very least she would get a, the opportunity to break up with him, but she don't even get that. <sighs> like th that's the part. That's another thing. Like I said, Vashti as a character, it's just annoying because like she, she's just a piece of car, but you, she won't even, can't even tell you why she wanted that man so bad. Like what, what does he have going on? Like you, we're willing to believe Yasmin and Josiah just have all this history that makes Josiah just like this great person. Right. Right. But what what does she want to be in this this little this little thing for? Like it would, and then 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 I think what makes it even worse as if they haven't kicked her enough. They give her one last punt to the head when they send her off to Charlotte because they want us as the reader to be like, and just so you don't ever have to worry about Vashti, you know, messing up their relationship, she's in Charlotte. Like, so you mean to tell me this cook? I'm from Charlotte, so like no tea, no shade. Like, I I my entire life. <laughs> Um, I've lived in Charlotte until I didn't. So you mean this chef who like has all these aspirations, she wants to be this amazing cook and all of this stuff is going to leave Atlanta to go to Charlotte to still work in the same restaurant she's working in with in Atlanta? Like, so she don't even get to get, she don't even move up in her career at best. At best, she's going sideways. But like, can we at least like, oh, Vashti got a great job in New York City working at a Michelin star restaurant. So she's going to leave. But we have this other cook who can come in. Like, we couldn't give her something on the way out. We couldn't give her something on the way out. And I'm sorry. Like, this is where I said I didn't want to talk about workplace dynamics. But it is weird that she got to pack up and go to Charlotte. Like, I'm sorry. Like, I feel like y'all used and abused her. <laughs> like, I feel like y'all broke my girl's soul. Like, I don't know. I just feel like as a kid, like she, it was hard to unsee how bad she was being treated. Sound off. Sound off. Baby, they sent her to Charlotte. Shout out to Charlotte. Shout out to the 704. But they sent my girl to Charlotte and there was nothing else. Like nothing else. Because that's because you're wondering too. Like it was done intentionally because like you would think like how you know he not going to be with her. But like actually no, we didn't think that because he wasn't thinking about her not once. Now when he act like he like a gun was to his head when he had to have sex with her the first time. When you, like when he was having that back and forth on like, but do I want to have sex with her? And do I want And then when he was talking to his friend preach at the gym and he was like you don't have to be disrespectful you too old for that pot meat kettle motherfucker like you too old for this you too he treating her he talking about her the same way you treating her like don't piss me off like don't piss me off i just i'm just like like why are you acting like she is chopped liver and like she's not the person who is bringing your restaurant i just feel like i don't know i would have filed a workplace lawsuit <laughs> does, does grits have an HR department does grits have an HR department because I'm complaining like I'm sorry the workplace dynamics and all of this didn't sit well with me and they treated her like absolute trash the best scene though the messy boots queen that I am the best scene though is when Yasmin goes to pick up that remote and Vashti just had sympathy sex with her husband. Oh my gosh, Josiah's going to hell. You know what? We might change this. Josiah is Josiah is the only villain. Like Deja going to hell too. No shade, thirteen year old. <laughs> she was mean. I don't give a damn. Like Kennedy Ryan did not have to write that little girl as mean as she was. Like sorry. Um, but you after he, she has sympathy sex with them and they go to pick up their remote. I was like, yeah, yes. And now you jealous. I love jealousy in books. Sorry. It's one of my favorite tropes. It's one of my favorite tropes. It's up there with cheating with me. I love the jealousy. And so like I was there for, it. and that's my favorite scene in the book where she goes to get that remote and she find out that her man, her man, her man, her man is with somebody else. But even the way she's acting, is just like, be serious. Like be serious. 
watching them on the god watching them after their first date i was just like and then he's treating both of them like absolute garbage too like uh, uh, and the thing is i like like i said i, I actually came in the book expecting to hate josiah because josiah rubbed me the wrong way from jump when the first chapter we get when he proposes to her and she's like i thought we, <laughs> why did i think that's why they were gonna break up <laughs> I was already there for the mess because I thought that's actually how they initially broke up. Like he proposed to her and she was like, I thought we were going to wait till you, we had money and you were out of grad school. And she was like, I don't want to be here anymore. And I just thought that was how the relationship was going to go. But then I saw a child that had hella kids. So he already rubbed me the wrong way there because like, do not be springing like proposals on the people. Like I think that shit is tacky as hell. And so like he already lost me there. And then, and then I didn't like the way he blames Jasmine for their divorce. I didn't, I didn't didn't like him I just didn't like him but I came around him because I thought he was a great father great father ooh, fathers fathers he was a great father um I liked his relationship with the dog another even even though Kenya does not like pets it's at my turtle I don't like pets I love dogs and books that's another thing that's not a trope but I love dogs and books I'm so sorry it's one of those things I love it so I loved his relationship with Otis I thought they were so cute um and so like I I came around to him the therapy storyline I came around him it's just his his stuff in the relationship I could not come around to so no but the remote scene is so good the remote scene is so good because I love mess Oop, wrong, wrong, wrong thing. He was, he should have, I don't know what the answer for Deja was because we don't beat kids around here, obviously. I'm, once again, if you beat your children, I am calling the authorities that need to be called. Um, I, I was thinking to myself, I was wondering, what is the answer for a child like Deja? Like, I'm so sorry. My child's going to have home training. So there's no way my child will act like that. What even is the answer for a child like uh, Deja? That's why I say she's a villain. Because there's absolutely nothing you can do with her. There's nothing you can do with her. <laughs> you just have to let her go through her, like, terrible teenage years. I was, I, Kenya was never a terrible child. So, like, I don't know how to, I don't even know how, the, how a child acts like this. But I've seen bad children, right? And so, like, what you, what can you even do with a child like Deja? Like, she has her convictions. She's 13 years old and she has her convictions. Like, she's just going to act like that. And she's going to have to wait till she's, like, 18 years old and realize that she's terrible. Like, you just have to let it be. You just have to let it be. Like, I don't know. Because, like, when she, he, every time she would say something about the mama, he would stop her. But, baby, she wouldn't have that phone. She wouldn't have that phone. Like, I got to hit you where it hurt. <laughs> you wouldn't be having that phone. TikTok gone. And, but that would just make her meaner. <laughs> like, now you having to be scared of your own child. Doing that would just make her meaner. She would just be more mean. I don't know what you do with children like that. That's why I ain't got no kids. Because, like, it couldn't be me. <laughs> you gonna have to live with your grandma. I don't know what to tell you. Like, you is not about to be in my house. Do please go. Please go live with your grandma. You gonna have to go live with your grandma. Because, no. Nah. No, you're not about to run my pressure up. Please. No, she was terrible. But like, what do you do with a terrible child? I never thought about this until reading this book. What do people do with terrible children who don't beat their kids like a lunatic? What do you do with terrible children? You just got to bear the fact that they're terrible. A little bit of therapy. What if they go to therapy and they still bad? Like, oh my God, I can't do that. Mm, Y'all better than me. Mothers, you're better than me. TikTok would have been deactivated. Phone would have been gone. Like now I see back in the day when parents used to do the most outrageous of punishments and you just like, what's going on? Like poop bookie, what's going on? Like now I get it. I would have found every type of punishment to, to do to her. Like, I'm so sorry. That's not me beating my kids. <laughs> anyone who's saying Deja needs to get hit no she's not she's just a defiant child and what do you do with that I don't know I would have to be finding all like no TikTok no having sleepovers like none of that like she was too bad to be able to be having sleepovers with people and going with her little aunties Ooh, next thing let's get off Deja's case for a second because I have a uh, unpopular opinion I didn't like Yasmin's friends either that was one of my first few I found them intrusive and a little bit crude I found for friends who haven't been friends with her that long. Um, I found them intrusive and crude. Like when she was, um, the first time we meet them and they're talking about like how attractive her husband is and like, Ooh, you still gonna have sex with him and all that. I'm just like, y'all kind of intrusive and y'all kind of rude. Like I'm not even rude. It's crude. It's they're crude less than they are rude. Like the stuff that they are saying, is just a little like, simmer down <laughs> like simmer down and then when the um 
when the girl, the one of the girl, what, what was their name? Soul Dad? How do you pronounce that name? No shade if that's one of y'all names, but like in Hendrix, that was their name? I don't even remember. But when one of them, their husbands was cheating on her and he comes and he's like, I'll do this. And the other friend like coughs and goes, bullshit. Mind your business. Mind your business. Like what? Like that was the big thing about them. I was just like, y'all are intrusive. Like mind your business. Like asking me if I'm having sex with my ex and not even in a like girls chit chat and way. Like y'all talking about how sexy my ex-husband is and what you want to do with my ex-husband. I'm just like, I don't, I don't like y'all. <laughs> I don't like y'all. I don't like y'all. Oh, 100 percent. And I won't be reading 100 percent. The thing that the, their best conversation was the last one when the one at whichever one of these people said that their husband was cheating. When they actually started talking about real shit, that's when they were tolerable. But like every other scene before, like, whoa, I didn't like them. I didn't care for them. I didn't find them to be, you know. I already have, I'm already iffy on side characters sometimes. Side characters and romance books piss me off more often than not. But like, I was expecting like a good fun girl group. And like, that's not what they gave. They just gave intrusive. And then because we know they haven't known each other for a long time, which I actually appreciated. That was in my notes. I like the idea of like post-depression friends. Oftentimes when people go through like depression in books or depression in media, People always are like, ooh, and I finally reconnected with all my old friends. I'm not depressed anymore. I'm not depressed anymore. I have new, I have my old friends back. But I like the idea of like, no, I have new friends. Like I'm a new, I'm a different person. I have new friends. And this idea that there's like, there's better days tomorrow. You can find new friends and you can have, you know, people who didn't know you before you can have, I thought that was a really interesting spin to put on this idea of friendship. Like she found new friends. Like she didn't want the same friends she had before because it reminded her of before. And she didn't want people who had seen her at her lowest. I really liked that idea, but did the friends have to be as annoying as they were? Like I didn't find none of their stuff interesting. None of it. Like just gossipy and like, <laughs> like just gossipy with no real like, purpose like I love good gossip like oh my gosh like oh my gosh my favorite thing in the world I was literally thinking about this nothing nothing gets the endorphins going like popping open popping having a drink with the girls and gossiping like I am so sorry I am so there is nothing in the world you know when people say after you go out to eat with friends you immediately have a will to live there is something about sitting with people at dinner at a nice restaurant having a drink and just talking shit, just gossiping just for the sake of gossiping. Oh my gosh, that's my favorite pastime in the world. Like, oh my gosh, just, so I get it, but they're just not fun gossips. They're not fun gossips. Like, <laughs> they're like, like I said, they're intrusive and crude. And I am someone who has three sisters. Therefore, like, even I wouldn't talk to them the way she was talking, they was talking to their friends about their man. Like, I would never talk to my sister about her husband in this way and she would never talk to me about my man in this way and like we're sisters like so I'm just like they were just I don't know something about it didn't read as like real friendship bonding it seemed it seemed like fake book friendship bonding and the the conversations and the way that they reacted about certain stuff. And it just, it didn't seem real until the very last conversation. So I didn't like them. I don't know what you want me to say. How did, how did Tiffany of uh, D. Jackson? I saw something that said fake forced. And that brings me to the next thing. I love forced proximity more than the next person. <laughs> But baby, she made sure to give us that forced proximity scene. Like, whoa, like, whoa. <laughs> like, it was so, like, there. The opportunity to give it to us was so there. Like, it was so obvious that I was sure she wasn't going to take it. I'm just like, no. Because, look, now in 2023, when two people go to stay in a hotel, it's almost, like, so expected for there to only be one bed that now... You can't do it. It's so expected now that it's now expected to not do it. It's now expected to not do it. Like now you have to subvert the trope at this point because like it's so a trope. Blame TikTok. Like it's such a thing now that like you're it, it's it's corny to even do it at this point now. Like we we've lost force pro now force proximity has to like 
evolve. And that's what's so crazy. What I loved about this book is the tension in this book until it's not, it's so good because they're already in forced proximity. Like I had, there is so much sexual tension between them. I felt it. I, them being at grits together um, in the first few scenes that we get to them at grits, them being at the house together. This book has so much forced proximity that feels like so good. Like I'm getting good food here. And so when we get to the hotel in Charlotte, like I'm just like, whoa, like, okay. Like this is cheap. Like, I don't know. <laughs> the forced proximity felt cheap. Like when they were talking to the um the hotel guy <laughs> and he's like, we don't have a bed. Why did what the name? Why did the name of that just escape me? The hotel guy. And he's like, we only have one bed. I was like, whoa, this does happen in books. I like literally forgot poor forced proximity was a thing. <laughs> like hotel forced proximity. I forgot was a thing until it, it happened here. And I was just like, well, people still do this. I also have not read many romance books recently. And the past, like in probably my last, in the 50 books I've read this year, like three, four are romance books. So uh, th I guess it's that I've been out of the romance world for so long that when that happened, I was like, whoa, that is a thing that happened. But it was cheap. It was cheap. Like they have sex in the hotel and it's cheap. That brings me to the next thing. I didn't want to have to say this, but I have to say this. This book has four too many sex scenes. This book has four too many sex scenes. At what point do we get the point? And I hate to sound like these like weird crude people online. Like, oh my God. But like, this is, y'all be complaining about sex scenes on TV and y'all really need to be complaining about the amount of sex scenes in the average romance book at the moment. Like at what point does, do you guys ever think about the fact like Fifty Shades of Grey was like, groundbreaking <laughs> because of like it's sex scenes but you can pick up any book right now and it's way more vulgar than 50 shades of gray could ever been <laughs> like we have to put a stop to it like we we i think we've flown too close to the sun i think we've flown too close to the sun because when it gets to the point where i am reading five sex scenes in a matter of 125 pages at what point at what point, if you're enjoying this, do you need to just cut on your computer and go watch porn? At what point do you just need to cut on the computer and watch porn? Like, what could you really be getting out of it? Like, it's not fun anymore. I love sex scenes because I love that tension break. Like, there's something that that tension break gives me that is just like immediate, like immediate rush. I'm just like, yes, like it feels good. But maybe it's because I've been reading a lot of YA recently and like there's no sex scene. So maybe I've now become like, oh, shield my eyes. Like, <laughs> I don't know because I'm in my YA era that it's just like when they kept having sex, like like the one to me, the one that sticks out, that's where that they have like a sex, like the, what, whatever the hell happened at the high school fundraiser thing like that. I was just like, could be gone could be gone. I'm just, uh, and then we get more. We end up getting like two, three more sex scenes after that. I'm just like, it's too much. I'm sorry. Kenya is going to go out and say it's too much. That's what I'm saying. Like, huh? Like who girlies to the front and I'm like, y'all know I'm a smut girly. I love smut. So I, I y'all have to tell me what y'all are getting out of these new, these new age books that are just shoving sex scenes in there. The point, the reason why I go so hard to defend sex scenes in media is because there's intention behind them. Like what sex scene, sex scenes are able to show you the connection that two people have. Like what they say during the sex scenes, how the sex scenes are like orchestrated. It says something about the two characters. Like in Weather Girl, when they were having sex in Weather Girl, the guy was fat and they were like, he they use the sex scene to show like how he was uncomfortable with his body and all that stuff and her like being okay with it. So you learn something from the sex scene. That's the point of sex scenes in media to learn things about the character, to have like these dynamics. It, it says something, it sets the mood, it sets the tone. It's a way to give characterization to characters to see how they are in their most vulnerable moments. But when we get six back to back, what, what are they doing after the third? that you couldn't, like, wh what are they doing here? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's not doing anything for me. I'm not learning anything about it. So guess what? I'm skimming. 
I'm skimming. And I would like to say, because I always complain, and I'm going to complain today, romance books should not clock out at three three seventy nine. dollars Sorry. Sorry. I'm purist in that way. Romance books need to end by 3.30. By the page 3.30, I should be closing the book and logging it on Goodreads. There is no reason why we're clocking out at almost page 400 of a romance book. There's no way. I told you guys, I give the, I'm giving this book four stars, but I have my complaints. I have my complaints. Why the hell is this book 379 pages? I literally put in my notes 50 pages. I could have, I already know what 50 pages we could have shaved off. Like the book is too long. The book is too long. And that's because we're getting drowned in sex scenes. We're getting drowned in sex scenes that basically tell us nothing. This book already did a good job of showing us that these two characters are sexually attracted to each other. And also when it comes to adult romance, I am an unpopular, a contrarian, if you will, because I don't enjoy dual POVs and adult romance. I'm on record saying that before. I don't enjoy, but I love the dual POVs in this because with that dual POV, we get to see how both characters are so attracted to each other. So like, I don't need five sex scenes to prove that. Like, why are you trying to prove to me that these two characters are attracted to each other? Kennedy Ryan, as a writer, did a great job of already doing that. Like I said, this book is so tension filled. I felt the tension. I felt the tension. <laughs> not could have cut the friends um there the friends do get too many goddamn scenes if you ask me <laughs> but that's because they were annoying i usually like i i can do it like if the friends are good i wouldn't mind it so i don't know maybe if they were written better i could so baby baby so many times there were so many times where i'm just like you know this is a good conclusion of the book this is a good conclusion of the book. Like, you know what? They're together because we already know they're going to get together. So like, I, I think there was literally, literally, as you're saying, there was a time where I was just like, the book should end. Cause I was thinking like, maybe they're going to break up for some reason. Like, are this, is this book really going to give us another breakup? And so I was just like, what could be happening in these next 79 pages that I need to read so bad sex scenes, sex scenes for no, for no reason. No, no, the last, I, I agree with you, Tam. The last 80 pages, 90, I might give it 100, do feel empty because the first half of this book is so good. Before I leave you, we are going to talk about what happened to her and the miscarriage and how heartbreaking that goddamn shit was. But yeah, the first part of the book is so good and so heavy. I loved, this is my first time reading in a long time, in a long, long time, reading a second chance romance. I don't know if I ever dislike second chance. I don't read second chance romance. It's not something I just feel the need, but now I'm in it. Now I'm totally in it. This might be the thing that cures my hatred of adult romance that I'm currently in. This might put an end to my anti-adult romance era. We will see second chance romance because I was like wait a minute maybe I like second chance romances because this was so interesting I love all the juice all the juice because how did I think she lost that baby at first I thought they was depressed they got a divorce because his aunt died and I said whoa that's a, that's a thing to get divorced about um <laughs> okay and then when I found out they lost their baby and so of course I was thinking like oh she lost her baby because you know maybe the baby just couldn't survive I don't know nothing about pregnant women so like I was just like okay you know she lost her baby I was that's still devastating obviously but I wasn't thinking like she tripped she tripped Oh, baby, that sent me for a loop. I was heartbroken. I, well, you should have seen me sitting on my couch. I was like, oh my God, that is devastating. That as someone who doesn't have kids, I can only imagine if you're someone out there who does have children and you've carried a child, how devastating that must feel. Because me as someone who has never carried a child, that devastated me. Oh my God, I was just like, God. And so like from then on, so imagine feeling that for all you people who are like, days of the child, how could she be a villain? Imagine reading that scene where Yasmin literally is eight months pregnant and all she is doing is closing up her restaurant and she loses her child and you can only and she still has to give birth to it it's a stillborn 
And you got Deja over there, like, really giving her mama the blues. Sorry. I'm going to war for Yasmin. I'm sorry. Being a child does not negate that you, like, you just don't do that. She saw her mama pregnant for eight months. Now, keep in mind, it was four years ago. So she was, like, what, nine. But still, you know you ain't got no brother. So, like, it, no, no, that's so cruel. Like, the way Deja was treating her was so cruel when this book explicitly shows us gives us the scene of how she loses her child that's devastating that's devastating and somehow yasmin has to carry the burden that her child is upset that she was depressed that she was depressed you can't i just feel like even at 13 you should be like my mom my mom went through something horrific no no then maybe in the home we need to be teaching compassion we need to be teaching compassion in the home. And that's maybe where daddy comes in. Because no, 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 no. Like, that's cruel. Like, when she said, why would you even want to get back with her after what she did? And she was saying her, her mom went crazy. She tripped. Sorry, trigger warning. She tripped and fell on her stomach and her eight-month-old child died while her husband was away. And to make it worse, she had to deliver the baby. No, no, no. Deja's gonna have to, she can, no, 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 no. And so then when you're feeling all the, like you're feeling all the sympathy in the world you can have for a human being in a book. You got Deja mean ass coming for mother? Coming for a mother. Don't do that. Don't do that no 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 Deja rubbed me the wrong way with that because like that really like whoa that really like that really like mm. it takes a lot for me to cry in books I'm sorry I cry more at like happy moments than I do at sad moments in books sad moments in books don't really get me crying happy moments in books get me you know I just love the it's why I love reading books I love the idea of like this idea of like hope that's why I loved all the stuff in this book about hope but no Deja mm, even as a child, she should know better. She should know better. Thank you. I was expecting that scene where she finds out that her mom and dad are together. I was expecting for her to like really explain like why she's so mad. <laughs> because I'm willing to hear a 13 year old out child. I want her to explain why she's so upset. Why is she so bothered? Like why, why? Are you deeply, deeply affected by this? And then, like, why? Now, I do blame the parents because at the like, one of my in my notes, I was like, why would they not give those children grief counseling? Like, y'all just was like, our children don't need grief counseling. Like, mm, mm, y'all, mm, y'all didn't win parent of the year that year. Like, no, your children need grief counseling. But I was expecting that to be explained. You know, like y'all are so worried about you know our boy genius brother my boy genius brother and then y'all issues like I kind of got put to the side like and so I'm bitter I'm mad and I'm upset but she doesn't really get better <laughs> she's like mama mama was depressed and I'm pissed and I'm pissed about it That's exactly, that's exactly how she made up with Yasmin. She still don't like her mama. And she deeply did not like her mama. Here's the thing, my mom used to piss me off too. Like, don't, don't do that. My mom used to piss me off too. But like, I loved my mom. <laughs> like, even in my like, annoying teen years, like, I love my mom. Like, my mama wasn't perfect. I, none of our mamas was perfect. I like, I deeply respected and loved my mom because even in the ways in which I felt like she fell short there were so many other ways where she proved that she meant well she was trying her best like all of our parents have been divorced before. that's an I mean depressed before that's another thing this idea that I can't sympathize with Deja or understand Deja because I don't understand what she's been through like I think all of us now that we're older at least if you're older can tell like you look back at moments in your childhood and you're like 
maybe my parents were dealing with depression. Maybe my parents were depressed. Maybe my parents were going through something. Like now with my adult eyes, I see like just being an adult doesn't stop you from having bad days. So like we, I, I when my mama was having bad days or my daddy was having, I wasn't over here like you ain't shit. <laughs> and my parents not together either. So like, mm, mm, mm. at 13 years old, I wasn't doing that. At 13 years old, kid wasn't doing that. And other people wasn't doing that to their parents either. I knew 13-year-olds. I know 13-year-olds now who parents, they ain't doing that to their parents. Like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What do you want Kenya to say? Kasim is my buddy. He was so cute. Like, just so adorable. Like, so adorable. And I guess it is interesting. Oh, if I if I can yeah, if I can take a little, I can give a little. It is interesting to see dynamics of two children and how two children are dealing with grief. But Kasim is written better. Like I said, it's not Deja being cruel. I was willing to see Deja as cruel and mean to get, you know, for us to get to the other side of that. I don't feel like we're ever brought to the other side of that. I don't think we ever walk over that bridge with Deja to where she's like, oh, I get it. Because seeing we do, we see how he's dealing with grief and how he's dealing with his family breaking apart. And we see him on the other side of that. We don't really see Deja on the other side of anything except like not wanting to go to school with a bunch of white people no more like that's what we get from deja like we don't get this like wow so even if you want to say what well, she's going through a lot the book don't even fix the shit she like what what she was going it doesn't even do do anything with that it doesn't do anything with that so what am i supposed to do what am i supposed to do is that be like deja is just a stock mean child character who doesn't have any and that's another thing. She's only mean to her mama. <laughs> She's only mean to her mama. So like, what, why is yeah? Because when you, like I said, are reading what Yasmin went through, you're wondering how the hell are you just mean to her? Daddy was there too. They was both arguing with each other. And yes, she finally ended it, but they was, ar I'm not about to do Deja. <laughs> Thank you. Like if that one, because that's also what I thought too. She was going to say like, oh, I'm just afraid you're going to leave it. Like it just, nothing was explained why Deja was just so mean. Let me go through my notes one more time before I leave y'all. I told y'all I hated her friends. Um, I love the idea about a family coming back. I just love the layers of them being a family and like a divorce. I don't know. I think I've literally found a new pocket of books I enjoy. Like, whoa. Like, whoa, Colleen Hoover, you kind of got this right. Raw, real, magnificent. Colleen Hoover kind of spilled with that. Like, whoa, like, whoa. I did, You guys, I read this book in literally 24 hours. Like, I had a blast. Like, it, it felt like I, ooh, it felt like I was watching a good movie. A good movie that I was like pausing and pushing play on again, back and forth. Like, I enjoyed this book. I cannot lie. So now I'm like, look, I'm digging deep. I have too many books to read. Like, y'all see all of these back back here I have too many books to read so like I can't buy more books or like but maybe on Kindle I need to go read some second chance romances with people who are married and specifically black people maybe that's another thing I enjoyed if they were black but I don't see why I couldn't enjoy this too if they were white too I don't know we'll see but like whoa can you like second chance romances like married people second chance romances it's my love of domestic thrillers I think everything is coming together I'm learning things about myself whoa is that what reading is about I, it's this, I don't know what it is. It's why I like domestic thrillers. I like family dynamics. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. It's my favorite type of literary fiction dealing with like a turbulent family. I love it. I love it. I love it. And this was that. This gave me everything I needed. Like, whoa, good way to end March. Um, And that's another thing, the divorce, the family aspects felt real. The friends didn't feel real. Vashti didn't feel real. But, and then Mark was Mark, but every, like the, them as a fan, the core, the, the reason why we're reading this book, it felt so real. It felt so real. Another thing that, oh, was devastating. Josiah in therapy. I dragged him a little bit. So I'm gonna come back to him and give him some nice stuff. When he was talking about like, how he, like only having one person left in his family, I was trying to put myself in those shoes because I think about this a lot you know how when people um are in the system like in foster care and stuff and like when they're 18 they're like 
pulled out, like put out into the world. I think if you have family, you don't realize like you should be deeply grateful for that. Like there's just things in life that like other people don't have that you should be deeply grateful for. Like, could you imagine being like having no one? Like, even if you don't like your family, you don't talk to your family, you know that there is something that links you to another person that's in this world too. Like, there's something that directly links you to another person that's blood, that can't be changed. Like, you are just linked to this person, like, always, right? It's kind of like when you go to, like, a city and you, like, know that you know somebody that's in that city. It's like, I probably won't go visit them, but, like, if I needed to. Like, there's someone I know here. I know here, you know? And... The idea that he has no one, he has no, I put my, and that made me deeply sad. That made me deeply sad, not for him in the book because he's not real, but for people who deal with that, people whose like families get in car accidents, like all of their family die in one day. And like people, like I said, who are in the system and then they get into the real world at 18 and have no one, like, oh my gosh, like that, like, like that was the first time in the book I was like close to getting emotional because it like put me in the idea of people who deal with that, that people who have just dealt with either loss, losing all of their family or people who just based on circumstances don't have family. Like, whoa, that was a little like, whoa. So I really, like I said, I enjoyed the therapy storyline. I did. I deeply had empathy for him. Um, what else? I think I got everything. Uh, oh, no. Oh, my gosh. When Yasmin, I think it was Yasmin who said that this is like second best quote. Though This is the thing that had me thinking. She was talking about, I think with them same musty friends, she was talking about how ya, uh, how they weren't, her and her husband wasn't compatible, how Josiah and Yasmin, they weren't compatible. And she was like, we weren't compatible in grief. And that had me thinking too, because that is so true. Have you ever been compatible with someone like in the ups, but y'all not compatible in the downs? It had me thinking about this idea of like relationships and what makes you compatible with someone like some because you can be compatible with someone even in bad times have you ever bonded or bonded with somebody just because y'all both miserable you y'all are great when both of y'all are miserable but the minute like y'all are happy y'all not really friends like, like it's not cool y'all only bonded in certain moments of your life and so that's another thing that made me think how like great love can be because like when, when two people can love each other through like ups and downs and see each other in all different types of fo and forms in their life and still love one another and still be there for each other. So this idea of being compatible in all parts of your life. And that brings me to my overall thesis of this life that I don't know if they need to be together. There's no proof that they're compatible in grief. She brought that up in the book about how her and her husband, ex-husband, weren't compatible in grief. And when I read 379 pages, there's no proof that y'all are still compatible in grief. Grief is going to keep happening. That's what this book shows us. People are going to keep dying. Unfortunate things are going to keep happening. That is just life. What have y'all shown me that shows y'all be compatible when those things happen too? What what happens when Carol, is her name Carol? The hell my name was Carol Caroline. What happened when she, when she up and died? And, you, and Yasmin gets depressed again because so is life. So is life. Depression doesn't just, you know, it keeps coming. It keeps, uh, yeah, yeah. We as much as we try, as much as we try, it, it keeps on coming. And so, like, what's the proof that when something bad happens to you again, and unfortunately, depression comes, y'all will be compatible then. And I think that 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 really was like, huh? Yeah, I don't know if y'all need to be together. I don't know if we've all done the work. I don't know if we've all done the work. But anyways. It won't be because they still want to have kids. I, mm, 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 mm. It brings me back to like her still wanting kids, them getting remarried. They're doing the same stuff they was doing back then. They're doing the same stuff they was doing back then. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a reprise. It's a reprise. They life, the new life they setting up for themselves, it's just a reprise. Because I think if you know better, you do better. No, he just was going through all these traumatic things. And that opened up another thing. And I'm about to leave y'all, I swear. It opened up another thing. We all do this also. Uh, sometimes you don't realize how traumatic. You ever listen to somebody? This is back when Ken used to, you know, used to have to go into work, child. And you ever just met someone at work or met someone in life and they start telling you about their life and you like, baby, you got enough trauma for both of us. And like, they just, and they're telling you about their life as if that shit is normal. 
Like they're just telling you traumatic things that have happened in their life. And you're just like, and you sitting here with me today. And that's, I think a lot of people deal with that. I think a lot that that'll be a relatable for a lot of people going through so much in your life and just thinking that it's life. There's some people who get punched every single day. Like life punches them every single day and they get used to the punches. They get you. Now, one thing about me, oh, I'm a complaint. I'm a complainer. <laughs> <laughs> I complain like I I'm it's very easy for me to voice discomfort because I don't know that's just how I am as a person I'm annoying so it's really easy for me to voice discomfort but a lot of people don't voice discomfort because they're so used to it and so they get punched in the face so much and they learn to take the beatings because I went through an era I call it the worst era of my life we are talking era 20 late 2017 to no I'm putting late 2016 to the end of 2018, my the worst era of my life. I made a whole Patreon video about this. The worst era of my life. Like, whoa, I was taking so many punches. And I just had to wake up and do it again and get punched again and punched again. I'm saying metaphorically. Um, like I was just life was life and so goddamn bad. And so I got used to it. And it wasn't until I was out of the situation that, like, now me now, I'm finally grieving the stuff that happened to me in that era. Like I'm finally healing from the stuff that happened because I ain't had no time. You just keep, you got to keep moving because the punch is going to keep coming. So you just don't want to, you can't, you can't have a weak moment. You feel like you can't have a weak moment because the minute you weak, that's when another punch is going to come. And so like you constantly, and so I think a lot of people could deal with that. You got to go to therapy. You got to, you have to, if, if it's just talking to somebody for 30 minutes and that's what your insurance will allow, just 30 minutes, just 15, like go talk to somebody about that. And then, Hey, the next week, do it again. Just get some of it out. Try to heal through some of it because you can get become so used to just going through it and it becomes it becomes miserable and you don't realize why you so miserable. You're like, my life is good now. Why am I so miserable? And it's because you haven't healed from the terrible shit that happened to you like years ago. Years ago, you still like, you still have this like armor on that like you got to protect yourself from the shitty stuff that has happened to you. So, yep. And that's their problem. That's why he that's why he was acting the way he was acting now. That they, they own way don't work. <laughs> they own way don't work. Your own way doesn't work. My own way doesn't. It doesn't work. Because if that was, then we all be fine. <laughs> if our own you gotta you gotta find someplace else. Because women don't women don't wanna go to therapy. You know, everyone deals with this. Like it's bad, like there's women I know who are like rock hard. Like they, uh, uh, they're not letting them emotions out. Absolutely not. It's just, you gotta, you gotta find another way. If the way you do it ain't working, if you wake up every day miserable, if you wake, if you see everyone around you fleeing, mm, it's time, it's, mm, it's time to try something new. But yeah, anyways, that's my thought, thoughts on before I let go. Um, our next book is The Neighbor Favor. I'm actually about to post a video about our next three books. It's The Neighbor Favor. It's, what the hell is the other book? Oh, it's, it's by Angie Peltier. And then the last book, it's Pride Month. We're going to do Friday, I'm in Love. I don't remember what the second book is, but yeah. Those, the neighbor favorite is our next book by Christina Forrest. But yeah, I'll see you guys next month.